Welcome, everybody, as the American Space Museum celebrates the golden anniversary of the dawn of the space shuttle era here at the Hyatt Place Studio, Hyatt Place Hotel. I'm Mark Marquette, so glad you're with us for our second talk of the day. And uh, we appreciate everybody supporting our museum. And uh, we uh, share with your friends, these programs will be put up on our YouTube and Facebook channels and our library. So tell your friends they can watch any one of these talks as we bring you a special event that the American Space Museum hopes to become an annual shuttle fest. Without further ado, our master of ceremonies is the voice of NASA, Mr. Hugh Harris. Come on up here, Mr. Harris. Thank you, Mark. And I'm glad you don't know a lot of anecdotes about me. <laughs> Find out. <laughs> sure you will. When you think about how the shuttle is built, you probably think about magnetic swaging, metal sheets, TIG welding, rivets, and loud hammering of massive metal parts. But Jean Wright knows better because she has sewed a lot of it together by hand. And, and on multiple sewing machines, at least the parts that were essential uh, to protect the crew of, on the inside. And by the way, the crews are grateful for that. And the, um, she, she, I might as well mention that she really began her sewing career at a very early age. And it was an extraordinary seamstress before she came uh, to NASA. And that she found her life's calling when she discovered that NASA needed a seamstress to keep a spacecraft from burning up in flight and re-entry. Although she is often known as a so sister, uh, her real title was Aerospace Composite Technician. I have to read that. It's I don't always remember it. Uh, she probably won't describe uh, them all now, uh, but you can ask her during the break about the 400 different kinds of seams and stitches uh, that she used. But with her on stage uh, is Terry White, who is something else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, he, he was the shuttle orbiter processing manager, and Gene was one of the hundreds of people that he orchestrated uh, to make every roughly used shuttle seem brand new again after it was brought back from a mission. Uh, Terry actually started working in the sh on shuttle orbiters as a technician for Rockwell while the Columbia was being built and a hand in every one and their flights from STS-1 to the very end of the program. One of the pleasures of his job, he'll tell you, uh, was to actually have hands on the flight hardware. I don't know how many of you have ever touched flight hardware, and you probably shouldn't have, but, the, <laughs> but, but he was allowed to do that. <laughs> And, and uh, he led large teams uh, to accomplish the hundreds of tasks that were necessary uh, for safe human flight. Um, for him, the astronauts were real people, just like the people next door, uh, since he was actually neighbors with John Young and Alan Bean while he was growing up. So we'll start with Gene. Thank you. What a little house cleaning is you have the front of you, the sheet of the line order. And Terry, lower your mic just a little bit. Okay. There should have been a sheet up there with your slide. I will manipulate your slides. Okay. <laughs> hey, I've oh, had that what, kind of day what too. Do, do what? <laughs> 
do what you want, but okay, we yeah. we can do just fine without slides. <laughs> well, that that's true, but I think with now, mine. Here, we go start first with you. There we go. There okay, go. we we use drawings. We used drawings to build the orbiter, but we did not use slides, so we can get by. <laughs> so, at any rate, Hugh mentioned a little bit of my background. I started out as an orbiter test mechanic for Rockwell. In those days, we had not even seen an orbiter here at Kennedy Space Center. I worked with people who had worked on Apollo, and there was a lot of systems that were similar on the orbiter, that were in the Apollo or other previous rockets, but this was a whole new concept. And Rockwell here knew that the orbiters were behind schedule in California, so they took a bunch of mechanics and electricians like myself, taught us a little bit about working on the thermal protection system, what the world refers to as the tile. But then they sent us to Palmdale, California to get actual hands-on experience working on Columbia before it ever came here to the Space Center. Okay, the, the Space Shuttle was a pretty amazing vehicle. When you look at the design of it and all of the things that they expected this vehicle to do when it went into space, and you go back and look, it did everything that the original designers had envisioned, with the exception of the very <laughs> short turnarounds. That was next to impossible to do with the way everything had to be back to brand new before we could fly again. But the vehicle completed a lot of tasks that the original designers never envisioned. And to my knowledge, it's the only vehicle that ever went to space and retrieved damaged satellites and either repaired them in space or brought them back here to Earth so we could repair them or evaluate them. But when the orbiter came down here in March of 1979, it had a lot of work still to do on it, and everybody, everyone realized that we could not do it with the manpower we had. So we went out and hired a lot of people to go work on it. They had no experience working on spacecraft. Some of them were hired right out of high school in that, and we had to go train them. We had to go learn how all these systems worked. I was offered a job as a supervisor in the orbiter's thermal protection system, so that was my next task. and. It was a brand new system. No one here knew much about it. We had a lot to learn, and there was a lot of things that the designers did not have correct, and we had to go out and work with the engineers from Downey and actually change a lot of the things on the outside of the orbiters. So um, it was a pretty amazing job, and then we realized that the things that were holding the tiles on was not going to work, so we had to turn around and remove as many of the tile as we could off of the orbiter before its very first flight. And if you go look at Atlantis, it has a little over 24,000 tile on it. Columbia had almost 33,000 tile on it for its first flight. So yeah, there was, there was a lot to do. It took us two years, but they wanted to get the orbiter down here from California, allow us to finish it, but we had to go through extensive testing. There are things we did in the early days where we actually wore out components, exceeded their mission life before they ever flew. We tested the elevons for 30 days nonstop, moving the elevons up and down and up and down, and actually wore out the actuators before they ever flew and had to go in and change out actuators. So, yeah, Travis is over there shaking his head yes because he was a mechanic working with me back then and realized all the different things that, that is part of the testing for a brand new spacecraft, a brand new concept, and that we were going to wear them out testing them before it ever flew. So um, I'm going to let Jean speak some now and talk about her part because, like I said, Columbia had almost 33,000 tile on it. What it didn't have, and this is one of the tile, what it did not have was a thing called flexible insulation blanket, and that was Gene's specialty. People don't realize how many things in that orbiter are cloth mm -hmm. and are hand-sewn in place or hand-sewn ahead of time or machine-sewn and then installed, and most of the things are in with buttons snaps, string, Velcro. and on the outside, Velcro. Metallic I, Velcro. Yeah, Metal yeah Velcro. we actually had stainless steel Velcro. <laughs> yes, we did. And then they were uh, 
a lot of them were glued in place. So go ahead, Jean, you can talk about the blankets. Okay, well, Terry was nice enough. I have blankets at home. I have a little sample, but his, is, his looks nicer. This is one of the blankets that we made, and looking at the side of this one, I would say that was probably a class eight. We did 11 classes or thicknesses on our blankets, but we had a wonderful machine, and I don't know if it's on a slide or not. Yeah. It's called a multi-needle sewing machine. It sews 30 rows at a time, and for anybody who sews, it was kind of hell, you have 30 bobbins that you have to make sure that doesn't run out. And anybody who's sewing on a project, our blankets we finished size were called PUs or production units. There's about a 30 by 30 inch quilted piece. Um, that, that's what upstairs looks like. That's what my upstairs looks like. So I, I, let me look at my, my pictures here. People ask me what the upstairs looked like. Uh, we worked at the thermal protection systems facility. The tiles were built downstairs. And notice how I say built. Even when I say I built my parts, because we were considered manufacturing, so we don't say stitch or sew, it's we built. So that's what it looks like upstairs a few years ago. That's me, and I'm going to jump right there. Okay, we're on this slide right now, and I know it's kind of out of order. But this right here, if you're probably wondering what I'm cutting, I think this is probably even beat shuttle for my highlight of my life. I ran into Mark Armstrong at a space event a few number of years ago, and when the movie First Man came out, and they were deciding the family was going to auction off fabric that Neil Armstrong had taken to the moon, he called me up and said, I have a special project that I want you to work on, but you're going to have to sign an NKA or non-disclosure agreement, NKA, uh, NDA. And I said, sure. So I had to go to Sarasota, and long story short, that's a piece of fabric that Neil Armstrong took to the moon, and I was honored enough to be able to be the one that he selected. He said, you worked on the shuttle, and I always say, if it wasn't for the Wright brothers, we wouldn't have had the space shuttle. He said, you were the first person I thought of that would cut the fabric for our family. So I was taken into a room, and I'm crying because you're looking at history. And I was scared to death to touch it. Um, but anyway, so that's me. And you can see how well-worn the fabric is. This is my multi-needle machine. I don't know if we can sideways, if you can picture that. Anyway, it's as tall, it's about 10 feet tall. We have it right now on upstairs, but we used to have the machine downstairs because it's extremely heavy. But this is the machine, there we go, that we would quilt our blankets with. It has three gallons of WD-40 in the trough. It takes about three and a half minutes for the machine to quilt one way. We turn the aluminum plate around the other way and quilt the other way. Um, so. That's interesting, because for as a seamstress, you're talking about spraying oil on fabric, and you're, it's driving you insane, but we need to do that. We have sizing on the blankets, and so it helps lubricate the needles. Uh, and after we make the blanket, it gets heat cleaned at 650 degrees for four hours, and we bump it up to 850 degrees for two more hours. It looks like a blue pizza oven, and then it gets... If we install it with our RTV, which is this red glue, because we use RTV for everything. It stands for room temperature vulcanization. Then it gets two coats of ceramic coating called C9, a clear coat. And then eight hours later, the blanket will be coated with a white one. And it sounds like a teacup when you tap it. So it's a fascinating machine. This right here, I love to talk about Lurch. Lurch is our 1914 Singer sewing machine. He was our oldest we had. For those who sew, we used industrial machines because we're sewing through thick fabrics. Uh, among other things, Lurch's first job was sewing saddles, so he could sew through two inches of leather. He was our oldest sewing machine, and I say Lurch because we have a Nasrich edition that started basically with the Apollo era that all of our sewing machines have a name. Uh, the Apollo uh, so, uh, sewing machines were both Singer, they were Big Mo and Sweet Sue, and those were the machines that sewed uh, ILC Dover spacesuits for Apollo 11 on, probably early, early Apollo. This is me when I talk about the hand sewing, the thermal barriers that I'm stitching there, they're done completely by hand with a high temperature thread called AB440. It melts at 3,250 degrees, bright pink. And you would think, okay, the higher the temperature, the more stronger it would be, but on the contrary, it's weaker. I was lucky enough when we were stitching the thermal barriers and I'm installing them because we have to install them by hand. And this one's in the nose landing gear door, the very front one, but all the doors have them. We would sew 12 of them and each part's four and a half days a piece to do by hand. And in installation would take two of us about 17 hours to install them by hand. And they would be roughly flight ready for maybe three flights. They could tell when they needed to be changed out two different interesting ways. 
we would take a piece of shim plastic and shut those doors, and if there was any movement at all, we would have to take the thermal barrier out and put new ones in. But another thing is, is we used to call it look like marshmallows, because if the thermal barriers got a light toasty brown that was a little bit too uncomfortable for the engineers, that would necessitate us to take the thermal barriers out. But and, lots of hand sewing. And interesting enough, Gene was in the fabrication world building the parts, mm -hmm. but not in the installation on the orbiter. Only when that, they needed us. Yeah, that was when the technicians were for me. But but my techs would get so tired of sewing these thermal barriers together because of the amount of stitches in that, and they actually had to use vice grips on the needle to force it through oh. there, a big suture needle. But uh, so after a while, they were getting tired, so I went over and got some of the Always people me. like Gene that worked at that, and I said, now, I can get you approved to come work on the vehicle if you want to come over and do the hand sewing because my guys and girls are tired. And so, yeah, she would come over and get up on the nose stand and sew right along with the rest of them. So, oh, yeah. Thank you. I was always the one who volunteered because, I mean, who would not? I mean, you're touching history and you're so close to everything. Um, it really, I have to thank him. I used to have what I called my go bag that I would have my glasses and my needle and my thread and I was ready to go. And the other ladies, for some reason, I don't know, maybe it was because it was enthusiasm on my part. I never missed a beat to go over there. It just smells differently over there. It's just thrilling to go inside the base. It just is. It just is. So yes, Terry's right. We built the parts over in our building. And when we say we're taking them across the street, we literally are taking them across the street. Because uh, our building, the thermal protection facility, is right across the street from what was Bays 1 and 2. Bay 3 was to the right, left of our building, if you're looking out. But we were almost in the parking lot of the VAB, so we were right in the thick of everything. But I want to say special blankets. He's right about the 400 seams, because we had a government book in each of our Blankets had different seams, but I want to specifically say when we built the blanket for the, had the flag on it, our other blankets are parts that we built, and keep in mind the shuttle had two and a half million shuttle parts. Um, we used to just put them on a baker's rack and wheel them across the street. They were wrapped in a special non-static plastic that was gray because, of course, you don't want static or sparks on anything around the orbiter. But when we did the bl a blanket for the flag, that was the one that we had a special server so that we did, us ladies did. Instead of wrapping it up in plastic, we would hand carry our flag blanket over just to honor our flag. And if anybody's curious, the last blanket that we made for an orbiter was for Discovery. So that was the last flag blanket, was for the last shuttle, was for Discovery. And back to the original concept and the approval of the space shuttle system, I don't know if you were aware, but Apollo, Gemini era astronauts went to Washington, to Congress, to get Congress to approve the space shuttle. It took astronauts to go up there and convince them that we needed this vehicle. And then what we did here at Kennedy Space Center, like I say, my function was working on the orbiter and that, but we received the orbiter when it came back from flight, when it was landing. And, and it was really amazing to be working a landing, especially a night landing, and standing next to the runway in the dark. There's no lights on the orbiter. It's coming back. You can't see it. You know it's close because you've already heard the sonic booms and all of a sudden it comes by you in the dark at 200 miles an hour touching down on the runway. So, yeah, that was, that was a, a pretty amazing part, but that's when the work started. Then we had to get the make sure the orbiter was safe, the crew was shutting down their systems inside, we were hooking things up on the outside, then when the orbiter was all safe and ready to go, we towed it back to the orbiter processing facility after my flight crew systems guys would make me go inside the orbiter with him and remove parts out at the runway. <laughs> so yeah, they, they always found out, oh yeah, it's really good to have management that's working for you. Get up here and grab these parts and take them out. So. Oh, and yes, it sir. smells. For anybody <laughs> wants to know what it smells, I've been in the orbiter about four hours after they got home and it smells like dirty moldy socks. That's what it smelled like to me. This next slide that he had up for a second, okay. Okay. Yeah. That's about it. That's about it. But once they bring it, oh, that's my so sister pet. Oh, that's me. Um, there we go. That one right there. That's just some of the examples of the flights that we built by hand. Now, you look at those ovals and you probably wonder what the heck those are. 
those are thrusters. We had 44 on shuttle, and every single one of them was done by hand. That wooden, wooden, wooden tool, those are tooling that we actually would wrap our fabric around there. And again, it's all hand sewed. A shuttle parts, failure rate, we only had a roughly 5% failure rate. But when we did thrusters, it went up to 12%, which you're probably wondering why. We have a spring tube that we sew at the top of the, um, the circle that you see there. Then we drape our fabric. Everything's done on the bias. People who sew know we have bias. That's the most stretch. So every shuttle part was built on the bias. So we're draping that fabric and putting it in. It's all hand sewed around the top of it, two rows of it. We paint it with RTV. It goes in a reverse mold to dry for four days. And that's where the tricky part comes. Because when you're enclosing that part in there with that RTV, it goes strictly on finesse too tight that you squeeze it, the RTV at the bottom is too thin. Not enough, it's too thick. And so quality will take calipers and measure the thickness of that RTV as it's coming out and we're trimming it. So the, the, th the thruster could be absolutely beautiful if it didn't pass caliper test the blank or the thruster was thrown out. So again, you're working with finesse. So you're talking human beings. So our failure rate on that was 12%, which is still pretty good. But very hard. It took a long time to build those too. But after we saved the orbiter and the crew got to walk around in that on the runway, then we towed it back to one of three hangars, the orbiter processing facilities that mm -hmm. Gene mentioned before, and got it in place and lifted it up to where we call the maintenance height. A lot of people don't realize in the early days, using hand jacks, we lifted. 200,000 pound orbiter up to its maintenance height. After a few years, we actually installed hydraulic lifts to lift the orbiter up. But these were all concepts that the original designers hadn't envisioned the things that we had to do just to process the orbiter. But the orbiter would be into the orbiter processing facilities, taking apart from its last flight, testing all of the systems again, doing all of the repairs necessary, any modifications necessary, and then when we're all done in the orbiter processing facility, including <coughs> installing horizontal payloads if required, and changing out all the interfaces for all the payloads, doing things like removing the potty. We were lucky at Kennedy Space Center. We did not have to clean the potty. We did, it's called the waste management system, but we physically took it out of the orbiter, put it in a special shipping container, and shipped it to our friends in the great state of Texas, and then they would ship us back a nice clean potty in a couple of weeks. So I always like thanking, thanking Texans for cleaning our potties. <laughs> now this slide right here, if you can look close, around the main engines, those engines in the back, the engine number one is top side, number two is on the bottom left, and then number three is on the bottom right. Thank you for that. That's really nice to do that. Anyway, you'll notice the white rings around the engines. Those are called dome heat shield blankets. We built those by hand by machine too. They're eight and a half feet across. Um, and we used lurch to do some of the stitching on that one, the, the closeout stitching around the semicircle. But our guys were very nice to us. Um, they actually built us half circle tables so that we could cut the serochrome, which is the batting inside of those. And um, it would take us a day to stack all three layers cut the serochrome because it's only 56 inches across and you're talking eight and a half feet so we had to piece it. We have three layers and draping the fabric and marking the stitch lines took us a day and those parts are again are about a four day part. We had 125 stitch lines that radiated out on each blanket and each one of them had to be hand knotted and, and buried because when you're working with flight hardware you want everything's perfectly smooth um, if I use this as an example as a knot, you're going to have drag and you're going to have heat that's going to be attracted to that area. So we're, we're building a blanket 250 times we're knotting and burying the knot. But what's so fascinating about that blanket and a lot of people aren't aware of is, um, is how the blanket was installed. I think the front of the orbiter is fascinating, but to, quite frankly, I think the back of it's even better because we hand built the parachute blanket that's right underneath the tail. We did the engine blankets too, so that's my favorite part. But we actually installed those blankets to a structure by hand. We had a wire thread called thread called Inconel 625 that I would take my two inch curve needle if I, call, if I was called over there, and I would stitch that to the structure before it be lifted up and put into place. So I think of all the installations we did on the blankets. Our domes on the back by the engines were probably the most unique that we did. And a lot of people don't realize that as well as being mechanics 
and electricians working on the orbiter, we also had to build, again, this was a brand new vehicle, brand new program, we had to build the ground support equipment. So we had to test it before we used it on the orbiter. So part of that was building all that. They, they had designed the platforms to allow us to access or work on the vehicle. But when we realized all the additional work that the original designers had never envisioned, we had to do all kinds of modifications to the platforms just so that you could work on them. You know, there were, there were days that you spent your whole eight hour shift, which most shifts wound up being 12 hours, but uh, laying on your belly, working on something, and that was the only way you could access that. But uh, it was a unique vehicle. Even the, the people that had worked Apollo programs before looked at it and said, we never came up against anything like this. And I'd said, especially when we returned from flight, we are taking it apart and inspecting it. And I said, that's because you never got your hardware back. And they said, well, you know, you got a point. I said, whatever we did last time, we got it back and took it apart and looked at it and says, oh, you know, this didn't turn out right. And I said, yeah, in an Apollo, the capsule came back, but it never came back here to Kennedy Space Center for the guys who worked on it to evaluate it and that. But the orbiters returned, put them up there and said, Travis, get down there and get below the floor level and take it apart. And now see what you did last time and look at it. So, yeah, it was a... Totally unique experience for the experienced people and for the people that had no experience. It was a it was a training and certification process that took a long time. And part of our job, especially part of mine, was teaching upper management, both contractor and NASA, what it took to put one of these vehicles together after a flight. So I even invited people like Jay Honeycutt, the center director, down to the orbiter processing facility one time, and I said, hey, you want to see what a technician has to go through to actually do a day's work? So he showed up. We didn't tell him who he was. It didn't take him long to figure out. But he showed up in, in a golf shirt and blue jeans, and we assigned him to a technician, and she took him up and took him to work, and he worked with her for four hours, and he came back, and he says, oh, my God, I did not understand what a person has to go through to do the work on this. He said, I'm coming back. He came back three more times, and we put him in the first time he worked in the aft compartment with a mechanic. We put him in the payload bay. We put him in the crew module, and we put him working four hours on the thermal protection system. So he, he had a whole brand new concept of what it took to put one of these vehicles together and we did that with center directors after Jay so they could actually understand what it took so yeah yeah, yeah. his his wife said one of his his pride and joys at home is a tile that we had him take off of the vehicle oh. that, that was scrapped we put it together in a plaque and presented it to him, and she said it is, it is at his house now. So, yep. Gene, what are you doing? Oh, okay. That's me. That was our fashion-ready outfit. If Whenever we worked inside shuttle, we had to put on this fashionable green suit <laughs> and big old, white, big old white boots that went under our knees. But you know what? I'm not complaining because who gets a chance to do that? I mean, the odds are very small. One of our jobs, not only in working inside, but um, people are surprised when I tell them we had to do work on the pad too. And you're probably thinking, what would you do on the pad? There's a Gox hose line that goes in the, uh, uh, on top of the beanie cap. And occasionally we would have to go up there because I liken it to looking like a dryer hose in the back that is pleated. We have a hard area and a soft area. And the soft area, because it would be exposed to elements, we would have to go up there from time to time and put patches up there. Now, this is a girl from Michigan who's afraid of heights, and you're going 410 feet up in the air. And I used to say a little prayer when I was in the elevator, don't let me look stupid up here because there's cameras everywhere. But it's beautiful up there. It's just beautiful. So I got to do that. That's our official patch. Our, our patch designer, Tim Gagnon, did that for me, for us ladies. And everybody, it's been very well received. So thank you for Tim. He does a beautiful job. Oh, yes. And, and I want to talk. This is another thing. This is an item that nobody ever sees. No one ever sees. We ladies built 5,500 of these blankets. We had two different kinds. This is a this was pillow because it's got layers of batting in it. But we also did one that was called MLI. So if I were to say that a blanket had 18 layers of fabric, you'd probably think that it would be very, very thick. 
On the contrary, that blanket would only be about that thin because we're talking almost hair thickness of layers. We had Dacron mesh and Mylar film that we would stack up, generally 18 layers. And so we would make a blanket this shape, make an MLI the same shape and stack it. And Terry's right about buttons. These are some of the installation buttons that we had. They're ceramic. And what I find so fascinating is initially the ladies would hand stitch the, the buttons on, which is a no-no. But we ended up finding out that if we square knotted them, they didn't float off into space. And when I worked on the shuttle, it was $3 a button. So you've got hundreds and hundreds of them that are floating out. But again, if you look inside the payload bay of an orbiter, you'll see all the white blankets. That's a beta cloth, which is a Teflon coated fiberglass. We built all those two. There's about 2,200 of those in each orbiter. But underneath that, are the 5,500 blankets that you will never see. This is called polyimid, and for anybody that sews, it's fascinating to me. There's over 40,000 holes per square meter in this, and the reason why we have that is the blankets will pillow up, a pillow up or billow up like that, and in place, it can compress, when they come back down to earth, it compresses down, so there has to be a way for the air to escape the blanket, which is why it has thousands and thousands of little holes. But this is what protected the astronauts from radiation. It's a special film, and we can date the blankets because for the first four years of the shuttle program, they were a blend of 24 karat gold, not completely, but a blend. So the original blankets in Challenger and Columbia were gold. Uh, the price of gold went sky high, and we could get the same property with polyamide instead of gold. So on occasion, when the uh, orbiters would come back and we would process them out, we'd be tickled because NASA designated those historic blankets because they were from the first two shuttles. We would get racks and racks of gold blankets that we would have to replace, and some of those dated back to 78 and 79. And the reason why they were in use for so long is they were nooks and crannies that weren't exposed to a lot of things, but eventually we would have to build them. Now, we made our own patterns by looking at the blueprints, which was a skill besides sewing that we had to know. But when we got a really, really old blanket and we couldn't figure out what the dimensions were or we couldn't find a heritage blueprint for it, NASA would let us take the blanket apart and then trace it so we could make our own pattern with it. That ha only happened with the very, very old blankets. And, and the original designers didn't env envision us replacing these blankets a lot. Most of the components of the orbiter were built for 100 flights because that's what a orbiter was built for. But mm -hmm. with the requirements changing along the years, then we constantly had to go in and change out parts that we originally didn't think we would change out. So there was a lot of access issues simply because of where the part was, but they changed their life from 100 flights down to, well, 25 flights or 10 flights, and we'd have to go in and change that. And then it it drove a lot of testing because any time we went into a system or took something apart, everything that went through that system, even if we opened up a wire harness just for one splice, we had to test every system that ran a wire through that harness. So we were constantly testing the orbiter over and over again. But what people don't realize, we did a lot of modifications after our two incidents. But still, after each flight, we would do modifications. And all the way up until even the last flight, we were doing modifications to make the orbiters safer for the astronauts for each flight. And I want to pass on one thing, a task I was given by an astronaut by the name of Steve Smith a couple of years ago. He was giving a presentation, and I went to have a cup of coffee and listened to his presentation. In the middle of the presentation, to several hundred people, he stopped talking, he looked at the audience, and he said, even astronauts have heroes. And he said, my hero is sitting right there, and he pointed at me. He said, Terry White is one of the people that worked for years getting the vehicles ready for us to go safely into orbit, do our mission, and come home. He said, so, Terry, from here on out, anytime you are around any other Shuttle employees, let them know that the astronauts consider them heroes. So thank you. Okay. Ah. Well, here we are. Home away from home. Yeah, here we are <laughs> taking a, an orbiter into the orbiter processing facility. It was a, a big garage that was built specifically for the orbiters. Most of the processing was done in the horizontal position. 
So here's another view of what it's like inside as they're coming in. Yeah, here it is coming from the runway. It's got all the systems hooked up to maintain. We still had to maintain the temperatures of that in the orbiter. So uh, there's a special cooling truck set up to provide power and cooling for the orbiter. You can see the tug <laughs> pulling it in. Once we got the orbiter into the orbiter processing facility, we lowered all the platforms around it and we closed up all the gaps to within 12 inches around the orbiter so we did not have to work wear fall protection. Yep, looking down into the, into the payload bay, the glare makes it hard to see, uh, looking at different components down inside the bay. And like Gene mentioned earlier, the payload bay and the crew module were clean room environments. In other words, you had to put on what we call the bunny suit, a special clean room attire, booties and that. And for people like me, you had to wear a mask because you had facial hair. Yeah, no jewelry was allowed, yes. no makeup, so there was a lot of restrictions, and that took took a lot of the women said, what do you mean no makeup? People can't see me without makeup. You're not wearing makeup inside the orbiter. I have a funny story. <laughs> Bless her heart, my friend Bonnie died. She was a fellow so sister. She died of brain cancer a few years ago, but I have a funny story. You talk about no makeup. We, technically, when we were building parts, I, you know, we really weren't supposed to, but Bonnie it was an African-American woman, and I only bring that up is because she used to wear this really funny foundation it was like an orange brown foundation and sometimes she would put her makeup on at her desk and quality would come by and say bonnie you know you're not supposed to do that she goes it's all right the part's going to get heat cleaned it's okay so anyway she was making uh what we call a horse collar it's a special blanket that lines the leading edge of the wing those are all done by hand too and so she accidentally got a little bit of foundation on the blanket and quality says you know bonnie we're going to have to scrap that part if it doesn't come out so keep in mind we have a two-step bake it's, uh, like I said, 650 for four hours and 850 for two more. Well, after heat cleaning, the foundation did not come out of the blanket. So all of us were shocked, and I said to Bonnie, what the, well, I'll say this, what the, hell, what, is, what the hell is in that stuff that even heat cleaning couldn't take that out? But anyway, so her part was scrapped, but she took it with a good, but, and you know, and she, she you're right about the makeup. We, we weren't allowed to make makeup, and, and you're right about jewelry. We call it FOD. And, and we all know what thought is. We didn't want anything. Once we went up above a certain level, everything. But I wanted to bring up, when you talk about building parts, we had what we called the EOs or engineering orders. When you're talking about how things had to change, before I had to build a part, I would have literally up to 60 pages that I would have to read before I even built the part. Now, you're probably thinking, what's on those 60 pages? Well, it talks about different transitions. Did we change the thread? Did we change the thickness of the blanket for a specific area? Anything. So um, I literally would have to spend time reading all the engineering orders or all the changes of the part before I even, could even start or begin to do it. So that took some time, too. Yeah. In, in the early days, they, we got a lot of engineering orders to change yeah, things, and we discovered them, yes. uh, that, that what they had designed wasn't going to work. But there were several engineers that just did not like my name because I would go to their boss and I'd say, hey, because they were assigned to Downey, California. I'd say, get them on a plane and bring them down here. He says, well, you can't explain it over the phone. I said, nope, they need to see it in person. So the next couple of days, they'd be showing up, and I'd bring them out on the work stands and show them how their original design was not going to work. They understood it all and said, okay, we'll go back, scrap that, and we'll come out with a new design. So, yeah. So that, that, was, a, that was very interesting to work with them in the early days and get all those things worked out. And... The orbiter had 22 major systems, and in those days, the thermal protection system was what I worked on, but people working the other systems had some of the same problems as well that they had to work out because, like I say, it was a brand new vehicle with a brand new concept, and we had to learn a lot as we went along. So. Tell us about this traffic jam. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people can't believe that there were certain times when we actually had two orbiters outside together. But in the early days, we only had two hangars, and eventually we built a third hangar to process the orbiters. But here we have one that had been in the hangar being processed. You can see the yellow beams on the payload bay doors because the payload bay doors are so strong fra backs. fragile. We strong have to put huge steel strong. strongbacks on them and open them with cranes and support them So because they couldn't open in gravity. No. They're designed to open in space. So that one was taken outside, and another one that had just come back from flight because it's 
it had landed in California because it's got the tail cone yeah. uh, on it. So it had just ferried back from California, so we had to move one out to move another one in. And in the early days, we were constantly shifting orbiters around. We would store one on the ground floor in the VAB where we are getting another one safe and, and the hazards removed after flight. Then we'd switch them in position so we could go back to get the other ready. But it was a, a lot of processing things simply because they didn't envision what was going to happen. So. Well, one thing I want you to talk about is people, we call it the shuttle eyeball. If you look in front of the Ohms pod, you'll see that there's black tile in front of there. It didn't start off that way. So explain the changes that we did in that area and why we had to. Well, yeah, we, we discovered things as we went along. Columbia had a lot of instrumentation on it. The other four orbiters did not. But we found out an, an engineer on third shift was going over data, and he found out that the leading edge of the Ohms pod was getting too hot. And that's where the fuel and oxidizer tanks are. So you definitely don't want that engineer getting hot. Well, he was that area getting hot. So he was trying to convince people that we needed to do something there. And at first they didn't believe him. And then when they finally did, we took off about 20 tiles on the front of each Ohm's pod that were white tiles, max out at 1,200 degrees. And we replaced them with the high temperature tiles, which max out at 2,300 degrees. It solved the problem, but it looked like if you've ever seen a, a moth that has the fake eyes on its wings and that, that's what it looked like back there. So it got termed as the eyeball mod on the orbit or something. So I'm going to, okay. I'm sorry. So, so we got time for a few questions. And but my question is, what was the black material made out of? The, the black, the tile? The tile? It's the paint. That's aluma borosilica paint that's on the outside. It's as thin as an eggshell. Aluma borosilicate. And you yeah. can see it's just as thin as an eggshell. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a flown tile, by the way. Yeah. This isn't, but mine is. <laughs> but 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 the, yeah, the, the, the tile is is 94% air, yeah. and the main ingredient is silica. It's sand. Mm -hmm. But that's what they use to make glass. So as long as you keep it below that temperature of melting glass, it is an excellent insulation. But then the coating gets sprayed on, yes. and to make sure that you get the right amount of coating on, it's done by weight. So that's all the technician is in their technique. So they practice, practice, mm -hmm. practice before they ever get the certification. But they could technically spray all the paint on one side of the tile, and it could pass weight. So it's all a matter of their technique, getting it on there properly and that. And the tile that we have are white. The, the raw silica is white. Well, if you spray white paint on a white silica, you can't tell how it's going on. So they actually, the white tile on the vehicle are spray painted pink. There's a dye put in into the coating. And then when it goes through its heat cleaning after it's built, it, the it. pink is baked out of it and it comes out white. Uh, one other thing, oh, I'll be quick. Everybody thinks it's the bottom of the shuttle that's the hottest, or the tiles. Absolutely wrong. The two hottest areas on her, we have the nose, which is the gray reinforced carbon carbon. There's a curved panel that we used to call the shuttle smile. And um, we had a special blanket that we would build in that area. That's all done by hand. Um, and uh, we uh, made a special four suction blanket inside the nose. And uh, so actually the hottest is that little chin panel underneath her nose. That's the hottest and a special blanket we hand sewed for that one. The inside has dozens and dozens of what we call puzzle blankets because they fit like puzzle pieces to fill the 19 inches of cavity. The second hottest is right in the crook of her wing. We have 22 panels on each wing. Panel seven, eight, and nine are the hottest. So when we lost Columbia, the damage was done from the external tank that punched a hole in the underside of eight. So once we realized what area afterward, we realized that was a death blow to her because, like I said, that's the second hottest area. It's right, at, right in the crook of her wing. So there was nothing they really could have done. But and, um, and Jean, I do have a, piece. I was hoping a, you did. a flight I was hoping tile. You oh, you and do? Oh, yes. sorry. My so bad. The, this, My one, bad. this one flew on, an, in, on Endeavor, and it flies on the very last row on the forward reactionary control system about eight feet forward of the windows, but it is the thinnest the tile thinnest. Exactly off of the orbiter. Windows. It's just a quarter of an inch thick. Now, so they vary in thickness depending on how much heat they're going to see and where they're at, and the thickest ones are four inches I'd thick. Say roughly four. And the average size is about six by six. This one you can barely see, but there's a trick. 
There's, like I said, two and a half million shuttle parts, but those of us who work on her can look at the number, and I can barely see this. His is a VT. That's a training tile. When you see VO70, that means it's flight hardware. VO is vehicle orbiter, and you have, you can't see this, but you have six numbers, but the first three numbers tell us where roughly it's going to go on the shuttle. So this one I can barely read. It's a 391. This would probably be roughly underneath the left wing is where that one would go. So we can tell by looking at those three numbers where it's going to go. I can barely see that. I think it's 391. 391. This is a forward time. That's a forward. forward. Well, forward let's test. keep on time here. Give him a big hand. Okay. You can ask questions <laughs> later. Ex excellent, excellent job, <laughs> Dean and Terry. Excellent job. Uh, Y'all can stay up there where we're going to take us out for our social media friends out there. We've got Stefano watching in Italy, in Rome, Italy. Hi, Stefano. We got Carrie Finks out there, Bill Sawchuk. Natasha Mia Bowmaker is in Kansas. One of Trekkie Techie's friends over here. As is Karen Lopez, another one of your friends there. Mark Usiak's in Pennsylvania, which Hello, he was Mark. here with his big brother, Tom, and uh, Dave Stangy, Larry Pushkar. They're up in Michigan watching us here. We just wanted to mention that oral histories like this and our whole program of Stay Curious is made possible by a grant we received from the Marie Louise G. West Endowment. We're very grateful for that to buy this equipment. So we are keeping on timeline here. The uh, if, you, if you didn't hear the announcement, there, uh, I'm going to take us out here. Gene, here, come here a minute there. And let's, let's take everybody out here with our saying. Stay tuned for Lee Solid and Dean Schaff, Chaff here. Great, we're gonna talk about the engines of the shuttle and the abort landing sites, all to bridge the space between us. Come back. Oh.